I'd like to begin acid-base chemistry by bringing up an area where acid-base chemistry is most important, and that's biological systems. So here we look at a, a process as an example of a effects of acid-base chemistry on biological systems, the denaturation of a protein. This symbol here is meant to represent, or this diagram represents, a protein. Protein is a linear chain of amino acids, and that linear chain is carefully designed by biology to fold into a form that can carry out some biological process of importance to the system. And we can denature this protein by putting it in conditions that cause it to unravel into what would be called a random coil, or just a string, instead of having this nice three-dimensional structure. And then we can reverse those conditions and have it fold back into the negative form. So what is it that we can do to, to denature this protein? And one thing we can do is increase the temperature. If we heat the system up, we can get the protein to unfold into this random coil structure. But another thing we can do is change the pH of the system. And how is it that changing the pH can cause this protein to unravel? So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. We'll start by considering how an increase in temperature can denature the protein. As we heat up the system, we're giving it thermal energy of magnitude RT. And this thermal energy is random energy of the protein just vibrating away. And if we look at this 3D structure up here, it's held together by weak bonds, hydrogen bonds and other types of bonds. And those with energy less than RT get broken. The thermal energy is vibrating the system around with uh, a random energy of magnitude RT. And any bonds we have here that are weaker than RT will get broken by that. And so as we heat the system up, it will denature. So how is it that changing the pH can cause a protein to denature? And to understand that, we can look at what might occur along these amino acids. There might be a side chain coming off of the main chain of amino acids that has a group on it with a proton that's labile. And by a labile protein, what I mean is one that can exchange itself with the environment. So this proton sometimes leaves and goes off into the environment, leaving behind a negatively charged group. So we've got the proton going off into the environment and leaving behind a negative charge on the side chain. And this negative charge is now embedded in the protein here. And so this side group goes from being neutral to being charged, and that changes the nature of interaction between the chain at this point and the chain at that point. And that can break apart the protein just as easily as thermal energy is able to break apart the hydrogen bonds here. And so the way that pH can denature a protein is by altering the charge on the side chains. And these are side chains that have labile proteins. In other words, groups that have a proton that they are willing to give off to the environment. And notice that this process goes both ways. If we're starting off with a group in a charged situation, it can absorb a proton from the environment. So this is an equilibrium reaction going between having the proton and not having the proton. And that's why this is a classic application of equilibrium theory. So we're next going to talk about what it is that decides whether or not this side group has a proton. And to do this, let's go back to the analogy with temperature. And in this case, the protein is being influenced by its environment because it's exchanging heat or energy with the surroundings. In the case of pH, the protein is also being influenced by its surroundings. But in this case, it's influenced because it's exchanging protons with the surroundings. So in temperature, we're exchanging heat with the surroundings. In pH, we're exchanging protons with the surroundings. So for heat exchange, the environment can be characterized by the temperature. The temperature indicates how much heat there is in the environment. 
and the number of protons in the environment is characterized by pH. And that's what we're going to talk about next is what is this uh, thing we refer to as pH and how does it characterize the number of protons in the environment. And by environment or surroundings we mean water. The, when we were doing the heat exchange we saw that heat either went into water if it was given off by a reaction or if the reaction absorbed heat it took that heat from the water. The same here. For the most part the protein is exchanging its protons with the water. So the pH is a measure of the number of protons in the environment in the same way the temperature is a measure of the amount of heat in the environment. And the environment for water chemistry is the water molecules themselves. And what does a proton look like when it goes into water? So H plus just refers to a bare proton. When it goes into water it attaches itself to one of the water molecules making this species H3O plus. Water is a bath for protons. It can both accept protons and it can give up protons. So if water gives off a proton to something, what's left behind is an OH minus. And so the measure of the amount of protons in an environment is the amount or concentration of H3O plus. And we use a shorthand of H plus for this. So it's a little sloppy of the community to write down H plus, the concentration of H plus, when H plus in water really lives as H3O plus. But it's a very common notation and so we'll use it in this course. The other thing that's interesting in water with regards to the amount of protons is the amount of OH minus. So the two things that measure the amount of uh, protons in the environment are the concentration of H3O plus and the concentration of OH minus. And so we see that water can both accept protons and donate protons. And in fact, sometimes two water molecules just decide to exchange a proton on their own. We can show that here. with the proton leaving this water molecule and going to this water molecule. We can write this as a reaction of water plus water going to form an H3O plus and an OH minus. And there's a proton jump that occurs to make the H3O plus and OH minus. And this is a reaction and it's an equilibrium reaction. In water chemistry, this reaction doesn't really have kinetics effects, so it's always in equilibrium. And we can give it an equilibrium expression of Kw is equal to H3O plus times OH minus. And note that water, since it is a pure liquid, does not appear in the law of mass action. So we just have the equilibrium constant is equal to the concentration of H3O plus times OH minus. An alternative notation is to ignore the fact that the proton exists as H3O plus in water and just write H3O plus as H plus which means we have water go into H plus and OH minus. If we write the equilibrium expression for this reaction we get something that is almost identical to that above except H3O plus becomes H plus. At room temperature the value of Kw is 10 to the minus 14 so we have that the product of the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus always has to equal 10 to the minus 14 in water and that's shown in this table where we have going across the top various concentrations of H plus. Uh, as we move from one column to another we change by a factor of 10. So we have 100 going to 1, going to 0 0.1, 0 0.01, etc. And 
since h plus times OH minus has to equal 10 to the minus 14, as the concentration of H plus drops, the concentration of OH minus starts very low and increases so that the product in any column, the exponents add up to, to minus 14. Since the concentrations of H plus and OH minus span such a broad range of 10 all the way down to 10 to the minus 15, it's convenient to introduce a scale that really just looks at the exponent. And this scale is the pH scale, where pH is defined as minus the log of the concentration of H plus. And this table shows the values that, uh, say for 10, we just take out the exponent 0, 10 to the minus 1. The log of 10 to the minus 1 is minus 1, so the minus sign here converts that to a plus 1. So you can see that the concentration of H plus is 10 to the minus pH. And this is convenient because we converted from a range that did go from, say, 1 all the way to 10 to the minus 14 to a range that goes 0 to 14. So it's a much more manageable scale. Right in the center here at 7, you can see that the concentration of H plus and OH minus are equal. And that corresponds to neutral water. We'll talk about that more below. And anything to this side of 7, we have a higher concentration of H plus than we do for neutral water. And also we have more H plus than we have OH minus. And we refer to that as acidic solutions. On the other side, where the concentration of H plus is smaller than neutral water or smaller than the concentration of OH minus, we refer to those as basic solutions. In addition to using a log scale for H plus, we can use a log scale for OH minus, and we define this similarly in terms of pOH is minus the log of the concentration of OH minus. And you can see that added onto the table down here in, pur in purple, where the exponent, the concentration of OH minus is 10 to the minus pOH. So pOH is the exponent that appears in the OH minus concentration. So we can look back at the equilibrium expression, Kw of 10 to the minus 14 is equal to the concentration of H plus times OH minus, and translate this into the pH and pOH scale. To do that, we'll take the log of both sides, and now the log of the product of H plus and OH minus can be expanded into the log of the sum, the sum of the logs of H plus and OH minus. And the log of 10 to the minus 14 is just minus 14, the exponent of the 10. We can multiply both sides by minus 1. And what we see here, this minus log of H plus becomes pH. This minus log of OH minus becomes pOH. And so the sum of pH and pOH is equal to 14 is equivalent to this equilibrium expression up here. So this is very convenient, as we'll see in later calculations. You can also see in the table up here that if you look at pOH and pH in any column, they add up to 14. So the next thing we'll look at is what is the pH of neutral water? Up here we said neutrality corresponds to pH equals 7 where H plus and OH minus have equal concentrations. What we're going to do is just show that that's true mathematically. So the reaction we're interested in is the water going to form H plus and OH minus, which has an equilibrium constant of 10 to the minus 14. And since we have neutral water, we're saying the only thing in the water is itself. and that means that the amount of H plus is equal to the amount of OH minus, so we'll say they're both equal to X. 
we can go over to our equilibrium expression and put in x for the concentration of H plus and OH minus. That means x squared is equal to 10 to the minus 14, or x is equal to 10 to the minus 7. x corresponded to the concentration of both H plus and OH minus. So we know both those concentrations are 10 to the minus 7, and that means the pH and pOH are 7. So 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter seems like a fairly small concentration. And to quantify that, the next thing we'll look at is what is the ratio between the number of, say, H3O plus molecules in neutral water and the number of water molecules. So to answer this, the first thing, we, we know that there's 10 to the minus 7 moles of H3O plus in a liter of water because we calculated this concentration up here. So the thing we need to figure out is how many water molecules are there in a liter of water. The amount of water molecules per liter we don't really know, but we know the density is a gram per milliliter. And so there's a thousand grams in a liter of water. And we know that a mole of water weighs 18 grams. So from that, we can get that there's 55 moles of water in a liter of water. At pH 7, we had the concentration of H3O plus is 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. So if we take the ratio, we have one water, one H3O plus molecule for every 55 times 10 to the 7th waters, or that's 55 with seven zeros after it, water molecules. So in neutral water, there is some H3O plus present, but it's there in very small amounts compared to the water itself. So if H plus is there in such small concentrations relative to water, uh, why does it matter? And when we started this topic, we said that one of the important things about pH is its effects on biology and that we can unfold a protein if we change the pH because pH measures the amount of protons in the environment and by changing the amount of protons in the environment we can cause the side chains on these protein amino acids to go from being neutral to charged and in fact we'll see that for a pH less than 4, about 4, a group like this will have a proton, whereas for a pH greater than 4, it will lose its proton. So pH is measuring the number of protons in the environment. As the pH goes down, we have an acid. Acid has more protons. So for acids where the, or solutions where the pH is less than 4, there's enough protons in the environment that this group will have a proton on it and therefore be neutral. And as the pH goes up, the solution becomes more basic. There's less protons in the environment. This group will lose its proton. We can also look at this in terms of the H plus concentrations. If, if the concentration is greater than 10 to the minus 4, this group will be neutral. If it's less than 10 to the minus 4, this group will be charged. And this is why the concentration of protons, even though it's often a very small number, does have a, a very large effect on water chemistry and biological systems which occur in water. So we'll come back to this. Right here I just gave the answer that the pH of 4 is the dividing line between having a proton and not having a proton. In a couple lectures, we'll return to how it is that you're able to calculate how much of this group will have protons versus not have protons as a function of pH.